All right. We're going to go ahead and kick it off so that we can get moving. I know we have a lot to cover. I want to welcome everyone to today's CNCF Live Kubernetes 1.21 release. I'm Libby Schultz, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm going to read our code of conduct real quick, and then I'll be handing over to Divya Mohan. A few housekeeping items before we get started. During the webinar, you were not able to speak as an attendee. There's a chat box at the top right of your screen. Please feel free to drop questions there, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. As well, if you join our public CNCF Slack channel, and I will put that in the chat, CNCF online programs, we can continue all the questions and discussion post-event as well and get to anything we didn't answer. This is an official webinar of the CNCF and as such is subject to the CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that code of conduct. And please be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. Please also note that the recording and slides will be posted later today on the CNCF online programs page at community.cncf.io under online programs. They're also available via your registration link that you use to sign in today. And with that, I will hand off to Divya to start today's presentation. Thank you so much. Join us today. Go ahead. We'll be co moderating this now with uh, Libby on uh, communication C. Uh, well, with HSBC as a team. Is the enhancement um, like this? Another one, um, Divya. I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I think something going on with your audio. It's kind of been cutting in and out and crackling. Okay, I'm really sorry about that. Is this there better? Let's try again. That's perfect. Uh, is this better? Yeah, I'm really sorry about that. Um, is is it perfect right now? Sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, moving through. Uh, for today, um, Anna will be first walking us through a sneak peek of what you can expect for the 1.22 release. And um, post that, we will be walking uh, through some highlights um, of 1.21. Here is where, uh, you know, Nabrun and Anna will probably be speaking about how the 1.21 logo theme um, came about to be. And um, we'll also be going through some stats for the 1.21 release next up obviously uh we are uh, going through the meat of the presentation which is going to be the six uh updates from the various six in terms of the feature enhancements and um a little bit of the time we will be reserving for q a towards the However, like Libby mentioned, and if you've joined in late, if you're, you're not able, if we are not able to get through to your uh, questions at the end, we will be uh, answering them on the CNCF Slack channel, which is uh, CNCF online. So please, please re request you all to join in there and, uh, you know, directly post in there. We will be answering and uh, taking a note of all the questions and answering there if we could not, if we cannot get them towards the end of the webinar. With that being said, um, I will now be handing it over to Anna and over to you, Anna. Cool. 
Thanks, Divya. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anna. I was an enhancement lead for 1.21. Um, and let me give you a sneak peek of to release. Um, so we started the release, the 1.22 release, on April 26th and is targeted to release on August 4th. Um, last Thursday was actually the enhancement freeze deadline where all enhancements wishing to be included in the 1.22 release ha must have their caps um, updated and merged. Um, as of today, right now, we are tracking 67 enhancements for the upcoming release. Um, but the number will change. Um, we have a few exceptions coming in. And with the code freeze, I'm not sure if um, the numbers will go down, but this does look like another big release for us. So um, expect a lot of things um, coming up in um, August 4th. And also, um, just if you're following along with the release, you'll actually notice that 1.22 release cycle is a little longer than usual because um, Kubernetes, Kubernetes release cadence actually has changed to three releases per year. So 1.22 um, will be actually a 15 weeks release cycle compared to 1.21, which was only 13. Um, this was changed to give uh, people more time to develop and et cetera. So um, now I will pass it to Navarun for 1.21 highlights. Yeah, I knew I was on mute. Come back. Thanks, Anna and Divya, for starting up the session really well. And thank you, Anna, for uh, the 1.22 updates. Um, so I will go over through the 1.21 uh, release highlights. Um, the first thing that I want to emphasize on is our release theme. So this time, we chose the release to be titled as Power to the Community. Now you may ask, like, what does it mean? Um, so one of the one of the things, or a few things that we have been doing since the past few release cycles, have been to make the release team more uh, accessible and more inclusive to each and every nook of the globe. Um, in a sense, like facilitating uh, people to allow facilitating facilitating people to participate in the discussions of the release through alternative meetings like um, meetings which are more in the uh, Asian or like European time zones uh, so that uh, people don't have to like uh, be awake until late night to attend the meetings. Although we do recognize that uh, having synchronous meetings even like even multiple of them may not serve the purpose of like uh, going to each and every person on earth. So, we have also transformed a lot of the processes that we have into asynchronous processes um, so that you really don't need to come to a meeting to uh, discuss things. You can just post something on the mailing list or uh, the Slack channels for the release, and they will be discussed there itself. We also started uh, more like keeping, keeping more lazy consensus to decisions and like letting people see and review stuff. In all, uh, we have been uh, moving ahead steadily towards our goals, uh, inclusion and more sustainability um, in the release teams, which uh, are continued, continued further in the future releases. Um, now, uh, what, did, what did we even ship in Kubernetes 1.21? So, Kubernetes, so every Kubernetes release, we have been like breaking uh, records of the number of features that we ship. Um, Kubernetes 1.20 before 1.21 shipped the highest number of features in uh, recent history. Um, in 1.21, we upped the game again with uh, shipping like 51 enhancements. Um, so enhancements is basically a term in the Kubernetes community, uh, which is given to like features how we track a feature from its inception to its stability or deprecation in certain cases. Um, also, throughout the journey, we label each of those enhancements into several buckets, um, which are alpha, beta, stable, and deprecations. What this means for the end users is that alpha users are usually like very uh, new features which are uh, introduced by any of, the, in, any of the working, any of the code owners who essentially introduced that feature, but then 
in the Kubernetes community or in the project, we give a little bit of time for every feature to mature and then graduate throughout uh, the several stages. So alpha features are usually like disabled by default on each uh, conformant and shipped Kubernetes cluster. Um, you can obviously enable them using a feature flag. So all of the alpha and beta features are gated, just that alpha features are disabled by default. You have to explicitly enable those features. Um, coming on to beta features, so when um, contributors or co feature owners think that, hey, um, this alpha feature has been in, uh, in the release or in the project for some time and it has gained enough maturity to graduate to beta, um, they, they will just uh, enable it by default. So the feature flag is set to true by default. Although if you feel that it's buggy or there are some things that are not suited to your use cases, you can disable it uh, when you are bootstrapping the cluster. So alpha enhancements see a lot of changes um, along their journey, but when you graduate to beta, making changes becomes a bit difficult because now users, end users do use them a lot and there are guarantees established. Um, and then once beta enhancements stay as beta for some time, they eventually graduate to stable and they have certain, they have like strong guarantees that the feature won't change for uh, in future releases. Um, it requires a lot of maturity for features to graduate to stable. So that's about how we categorize things. Uh, coming to numbers of 51 enhancements, we uh, the community graduated uh, 13 enhancements to stable, which means uh, they are like, they will be there in the Kubernetes project for some time. Um, and then 15 enhancements have been graduated from alpha to beta, that means we see a lot of confidence in all those features that they are going towards stable and are consumable to end users. We have also introduced like 21 new features uh, as alpha features in Kubernetes 1.21 that you can just check out uh, by enabling the feature flag uh, when you are bootstrapping a Kubernetes cluster. Apart from that, we have deprecated two features which we will discuss in detail when we go through each of the uh, code ownership updates. Um, so you will come to know that. Moving ahead, um, we have certain major themes for Kubernetes 1.21. We are just uh, emphasizing a few of them in this slide and the next one. Um, number one, the cron job resource has graduated to stable. What this means is uh, cron jobs have been beta for some time and uh, back in, uh, if I remember correctly, 1.19, there was an effort to actually revamp the cron job controller to newer controller standards and make it more faster. Um, that happened in 1.19 and just 1.21, uh, it has graduated to stable and the old controller code has been removed. Um, also the feature gates have been removed. The next feature which graduated to stable is, and which is one of our major themes, is immutable secrets and config maps. What it means is that um, when, whenever you create a secret or a config map, you can set uh, that, hey, this is immutable. So any more uh, update uh, requests to those won't be visible. We will also see a, it a bit in detail when we talk about the storage updates, uh, because this is a really cool feature. Um, Next comes up is IPv4, IPv6 dual stack support, which uh, has graduated to beta. Um, this is a revolution and a lot of work has went, uh, has went into uh, making this happen. Um, kudos to all those people involved in, the, in it. Graceful node shutdown has also um, graduated to beta. Um, we will see um, in the SIG nodes updates, uh, what does it mean for you and uh, a bit more in detail. And we have more major themes in this release. Um, one of the things that happened is um, whenever you create a persistent volume, there are there were no like uh, mechanisms where you can check uh, and the Kubernetes API server could check whether the underlying resource of your infrastructure provider is healthy or not. So now we do have a mechanism for it. Although it has graduated to alpha, you can still check out this feature um, by enabling the feature flag. Um, along with that, um, we have reduced a bit of uh, like 
I think a lot of Kubernetes build maintenance. Um, this is mostly uh, for the upstream contributors in the sense that uh, we, before this happened, we had two kinds of build tooling. One was the native uh, Go tool, Go toolchain based tooling, and the other one was Bazel. Um, with this uh, announcement, uh, Bazel based tooling has been removed from the core Kubernetes repository and every uh, or each of the processes have been transformed to Go tooling based. Now, um, remember I talked about two deprecations. Um, we deprecated pod security policy, um, which was a massive change. Uh, it created a, a bit of uproar in the end user community as well. Although we will understand a bit more uh, in detail later on, what does it mean for the end users and how they can mitigate around it and what comes next. Um, on top of it, we uh, or the the specific uh, code owners who own topology key have deprecated it in favor of like uh, better options. Going ahead, um, so Anna and I will go through the special interest groups which have uh, shipped features in Kubernetes 1.21, and we will go through each of those features and give you a short overview. Um, why, why do I say short? In, because in the interest of time, we did ship a lot of features this release cycle, um, and uh, it, it is a long list. But before going through all of that, I want to just say two things here. Um, what special interest group means is special interest groups are, work, are uh, units of people inside the Kubernetes community or their community groups which own specific areas of code. So each SIG is delegated with one specific area in the core Kubernetes repository. Um, namely, like you have API machinery, you have Node, you have CLI. API machinery handles everything related to the Kubernetes API server, the API types, API expressions. Um, Node maintains kubelet, um, any, other, uh, any other code which is uh, relevant to um, the operations of Node and surrounding it. Uh, CLI handles kubectl and anything uh, which you need to do in kubectl. Uh, these are just examples. We will go through more six. Um, the other thing is, since we will be briefing out on things, you still can go ahead and read in more detail. Each of the slides, um, like each of the slides, will have linked to a tracking issue and an enhancement proposal. So the enhancement proposal actually the feature proposal where each uh, an enhancement or a feature owner have written like what are their motivations, what are their goals, what is the non-goal, uh, and some implementation details of those. So you can just skim through the cap in order to understand like what each feature means. So now, um, having said all that, uh, the first thing we will go through is API machinery. Um, and one of the first enhancements that they shipped, uh, and they shipped it uh, they graduated to beta is efficient watch resumption after cubes API server reboot. What it means is, so whenever uh, you restart API server and you do a tons of like, uh, so whenever you restart API server, it needs to like refresh the watch cache from its city. And many times it may happen that the resource version is like out of sync. So if you have like a lot of like watches to the API server, you may do a ton of real lists, which may create unnecessary load on the uh, Etcidian API server. So this has been resolved and which has resulted in like uh, avoiding tons of real lists during the API server rolling upgrades. Basically at that time you uh, stop one old API, old version Kubernetes API server, and then you start a new one. Um, this also avoids like different instances of API server being stuck with like the watch cache uh, sync to different resource versions uh, for a long period of time. Um, you can obviously uh, go through the NASM proposal and read about it more in detail. Next up is uh, you might have heard about this feature called server side apply. So what it does is whenever you apply any new Kubernetes resource, earlier it used to happen, the diff used to happen on the client side, and then the diff used to be sent. Now, um, the calculation can even happen on server side apply, but then what if you want to do in a programmatic uh, way in client go? Um, so 
earlier, what you needed to do is you needed to use a patch type called apply patch type and give it a binary of or, or bytes of YAML or JSON to the API server so that the API server takes in and does SSA operations. Um, with uh, client go shipping uh, apply configurations, you don't need to do it anymore. You have like types that will help you doing server side apply from client go. Um, with that, server side apply can go GA, which is, I think, slated to happen in Kubernetes 1.22, uh, the current release cycle. So do uh, track that. Um, the third thing that APM machinery has shipped is so oftentimes you want to select namespaces reliably using the traditional methods of label selectors. With a small change, um, may not be small, but it's like um, whenever you create a name, namespace, a reserved label called kubernetes.io slash metadata.name gets added as a label to the namespace metadata um, so that you can efficiently like choose that namespace using this label. Um, with that, those are the three announcements that API machinery has shaped. Um, and they did a great job with a lot of those announcements, like going into beta and making it available for users to uh, use by default. Um, moving over to the next SIG, it is apps. Um, apps also shipped a lot of interesting things. Primarily, the first thing being cron jobs uh, graduating to stable. As I mentioned, uh, the old controllers are now removed and feature flags are also not present. So the new controller has become the way to go. Um, for your uh, cron jobs. Uh, so if you have been using cron jobs since Kubernetes 1.19, you might have been using the new controller by default. Um, it's just that now the old controller is not there anymore and it's more transparent for you. Uh, next up is pod disruption budget has graduated to stable. Uh, which also makes uh, pod disruption budgets mutable, so you can change them after even after you create them. Um, along with that, uh, the team has also addressed a lot of performance issues with the uh, pod disruption budget controller. Next up, um, so this is a bit interesting. So suppose you're a cluster admin and your cluster users are creating a lot of jobs, um, and if you have like a high-ish number of cardinality and high-ish number of uh, completion counts, you will have a lot of pods uh, which will be there in the uh, cluster, pod resources which will be there in the cluster. Now they are not cleaned automatically by default. You do have to run an operation. With this feature, it makes it easy for users to actually specify a TTL, a time to live for uh, those, those resources. This controller will basically read what you specify as uh, the TTL and then keep on deleting jobs and parts which have completed and finished successfully. That, that's one. Um, next up is uh, random part selection and replica set downscale. Um, now, if you as a user have been uh, using replica sets and have been like constantly upscaling or downscaling them, you might have noticed that the pod that is killed on a downscaled, downscale event is usually the last pod which was created, uh, like higher number. Now, it, it may happen that if it was created later, it may be doing some, some work uh, it may be handling some workload which has recently started and it may be detrimental for your use case to actually kill a pod which has started like very recently. Um, so it introduces a randomized uh, heuristic uh, so that randomly any of the pods in the triplica set are selected and killed um, so that that behavior does not come into picture where uh, your workload may be hampered. Next up uh, is index job. Oh, also, um, I have to mention that uh, this feature is in alpha, so you would need to enable the feature flag to uh, have this logic working in your cluster. Um, in case of, uh, so the next up is index job. So 
often people may run like machine learning workloads so machine learning workloads may be one of the cases or uh, there may be cases where your workload may need or may require some kind of index for the completion of that job so with this change you can actually specify uh, that this job is indexed and a job completion index environment variable would be there in the uh, container uh, of the containers of in that pod created by the job. Um, here in this example, you can see that um, a specific process like image processing task um, is taking the index, which is reading the environment variable basically. And it can also take a hosts pattern to effectively talk to another pod created by that job. So here it becomes like a bit deterministic in talking to other processes if you want. Uh, and this is this can be easily handled by addition, adding a headless, headless service, which points to uh, each of the pod in that job, uh, specifically using a uh, label selector. Um, the next feature is the ability to suspend jobs. Um, so if you have been users of uh, the job resource, you might have noticed that in order to like uh, halt a job, you can easily like delete it. But when you delete a job, the metadata, like how many, how many times the job has completed or how many times the job has failed to complete is lost. Now with this change, there has been a suspend field added to the job specification, which you can set to true, which will just suspend the job's execution. So any existing part, uh, will be running and then uh, there will be no new parts created. And then if you want to resume it again, you can just unsuspend this job. This is also alpha. So you would need to enable it through the feature gate. Um, next up. Um, so we, we have been talking about a lot of changes to replica sets. And this is one other change where um, you can influence the order of part deletion on downscale events. So you might think like, Intuitively, it is opposite to the randomized one, but it's like adding features layer over layer. So one, number one, um, replica set downscale events will randomly delete a part. But then if you want to control the heuristic a bit, you can specify an annotation called uh, controller.kubernetes.io slash pod deletion cost and specify a value. Um, so the pods with the lower value will be deleted first. So this is how you can actually determine a little bit of the heuristic of or control the heuristic of how your pods uh, get deleted when there is a replica set downscale event. This is also alpha. So you would need to um, enable the feature flag. Uh, having said that, I just want to shout out, uh, just want to just wanted to give a shout out to SIG uh, apps. They have been doing an awesome job in enhancing the user experience for uh, jobs, replica sets, and cron jobs. And thank you to them. Um, also, a lot of these features are in alpha. So please feel free to um, intentionally you enable them and use them and give feedback to the community. The community would be really uh, indebted for that. Um, next up. We have a special interest group auth who handle the authentication mechanisms in Kubernetes. Um, we now come to a very interesting announcement, which is uh, pod security policy. There have been a lot of like discussions on social media on several channels about it. But um, one thing I, I would like to mention here is that pod security policy has been deprecated and is slated to be removed in 1.25. It does not mean that you can't use pod security policy now. You can still use it, but we would highly recommend you to use the other replacements that are there so that your transition or your clusters transition in moving from PSP, uh, pod security policy to the alternate is smooth. Um, so you can read the deprecation blog, which um, and by the uh, authentic security folks um, who are the primary uh, drivers here that Kubernetes is a community work. So a, a lot of people have been driving it uh, just that I want to shout, give a shout out to them. Um, so a replacement is also being worked on. Um, 
the link is also in the slide so please 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 if you are a user of pod security policy i would urge you to go and look at what is the replacement and give your feedback the community the kubernetes community and the upstream contributor community strives on such feedbacks so please do that um moving ahead to the next announcement from auth is so client go has needs to like can have some way to uh, authenticate requests right from external providers with this announcement um client go provides for a mechanism for you to implement out of tree providers now what do i mean by out of tree out of tree in kubernetes communities context is that the code does not reside in kubernetes slash kubernetes the code does not reside in the kubernetes code base what you can do is you can implement an out implement a credential provider and then when you use client go you can basically specify that as a uh, provider now you may have already used like gcp and azure uh, providers which are inbuilt into kubernetes kubernetes now they will eventually uh, be deprecated and in favor of like out of tree uh, providers this is still in beta so it would need to go ga and then uh, however uh, things will get progressed um, one thing to note here is that it also essentially means that credentials can be rotated without even restarting the client processes so since the credentials lie uh, out of bounds or out of tree from the client go or or the process that you are running to talk to uh, the api server uh, you don't need to essentially restart that process uh, and resulting in like your workloads not being hampered um next up so bound service account tokens are um a cluster of uh, features if i if i can phrase it that way um which involve like uh, separate announcements together so one of one of them is like separating the root ca config map from bound service account token volume so with this the audience of issued uh, json web tokens would be bound and also like auto configured service account tokens in pods can use those projected tokens so it will now become more efficient in while you are using this uh remember i mentioned like bound service account tokens are a cluster of uh, different things um with that like root ca config map also goes to ga eventually like paving path for the other parts of bound service account tokens to uh, become uh, or to graduate or evolve in their uh, functionality um with this a config map config map called uh, cube root ca.crt um will be published to every namespace so that it can be uh used by uh, any workload uh, to server and verify those connections so this will also be helpful um, when you are designing workloads which run in cluster um next up um service account signing key retrieval so what happens now is um when you have like service account uh, service account tokens inside a cluster um having this graduated to stable will allow the authorized systems to discover any information they need to authenticate those tokens um one of one of the important facts uh, one of the important goals actually um with this feature is that the kubernetes api server api server should eventually be like open id connect compatible and not have our own like uh, api structures or our own interfaces um this is also going to stable um with that um there has been a lot of work in um the auth side of things specifically around psp um so do give feedback in any of the things that you uh, feel necessary um having said that um moving over to cli uh, there have been two improvements uh, to kubectl um and both both of them are alpha um so one of the things uh, which caters more to uh cluster admins who want some metrics to understand the behavior of users who are like calling the kubernetes api server so each of the kubernetes uh command operations not each there are uh, like specific cases where 
the kubectl will along with the request to the api server also include headers like kubectl hyphen command kubectl hyphen flags and kubectl hyphen session um, which will help you to essentially build more telemetry operations in like uh, in, in like several use cases where you want to know like what kind of uh, operations your uh, engineers or your uh, cluster users are uh, doing. Uh, the kubectl session uh, value is basically in UID, which will like pers which will be like different in in case of each session. Next up, um, this is also one of the interesting things in like user behavior. So let's say whenever you do kubectl logs or you do kubectl exec, you specify the pod name. And along with it, if your pod has like multiple containers, you have to specify a flag minus C and specify the name of the container that you want to operate on, uh, be it an exec operation, be it a uh, logs operation. With this feature, you can actually write an annotation uh, for that pod, like what is your default container? So if you don't specify the minus C flag, you base uh, the Kubernetes, uh, the kubectl will uh, assume from the annotation which container you mean. Now, minus C still takes precedence, just that if you don't uh, specify the flag, it will take the default one. Those are the two things uh, shipped by 6CLI. Um, so I think as a, as a cluster user, this, uh, these two enhancements would be really like awesome to see being used, um, and gather more insights, uh, moving to cloud provider. Um, so special interest group cloud provider shipped a leader migration mechanism for controller managers as alpha. Uh, what this helps with is now, um, so all of the out of the tree cloud providers that you have, uh, like if you want to do a migration of Kubernetes API server, which has an entry provider to a Kubernetes API server version, which is like out of tree cloud provider, there is now a mechanism which will help you to do it in a highly available way. So this announcement basically defines all the guidelines that you need to follow, like any locking mechanism or any resource logs that you want to put on uh, the Kubernetes API and then do the migration. Uh, kudos to them for shipping such an is useful thing. Um, with that, I will hand over the baton to Anna, who will be uh, going through a few more SIGs. Cool. Thanks, Navarin. Um, let's take hey. a look at um, updates from SIG instrumentation, which had five enhancements in 1.21. First one up is metrics stability enhancement graduates to stable. Um, metrics are categorized as either alpha or stable. And when alpha, um, alpha metrics can be deleted at any time and stable metrics are guaranteed not to change. Um, but when a stable, uh, so this enhancement um, actually um, gives a better um, ability to deprecate stable metrics. So it will start marking things as deprecated and you'll see deprecation notice in the description text in the warning log. And then eventually the metrics will be hidden and then removed. Next, please. Um, next, we have the structure logging, which actually still remains in alpha. Um, structure logging defines standard structure for Kubernetes log messages. And uh, starting in 1.21, it is available for Kubelet. And even though it didn't graduate to the next stage, um, there was a lot of effort put into this during 1.21. So yeah, next, please. Um, exposed metrics about resource requests and limits that represent POM model um, graduates to beta. Um, this enhancement allows Coop scheduler to expose um, optional metrics that reports the requested resource and the desired limit of all running pods. Next. Um, oh, um, defend against loading secret via static analysis. Um, this is the one where static analysis um, now can be used during testing to prevent various types of uh, sensitive information. Um, yeah, 
Uh, sorry, this graduates to beta. Next, please. Um, metrics. Uh, metric um, cardinality enforcement is a new enhancement, and this mitigates the memory leak um, that has been identified with metrics. So this enhancement introduced um, the ability to turn off metrics and set a list of allowed values for the metrics. Um, so a lot of great metrics related changes from SIG instrumentation um, in this release. So shout out to them for everything and specifically the structured logging efforts. Now we can take a look at the SIG network. So SIG network had nine enhancements. Um, first one up is um, IPv4, IPv6 dual stack support. Uh, it graduates to beta and dual stack support in Kubernetes um, means that pods and services and nodes can get IPv4 and IPv6 addresses and it's now enabled by default. Next, um, next we have endpoint slice API graduates to stable. Um, endpoint sli um, slice API was introduced to solve existing performance problems with the endpoint API. And this does that by like splitting the endpoints into several endpoint slice resources. And with V1 um, topology field has not been removed in favor of fields like node name and zone. And um, it has a it adds annotation to indicate overcapacity for endpoint resource with more than thousand endpoints. Next, um, next we have service type load balancer class. Um, it, this is one of the new enhancements that enables option to specify the class of a load balancer implementation for services type load balancer. So um, to allow user to leverage multiple service types in a cluster. And this is the lightweight approach until the gateway of API becomes mature. Next, um, next we have network policy port range. Um, another new en enhancement from SIG network. Um, I think this would make a lot of people happy. Um, this enhancement allows you to write one rule for network policy that targets range of ports instead of writing one uh, rule for every port. Um, and there's a new field now called end port to leverage the uh, range of ports. Cool. Um, next one is service internal traffic policy. This is also a new enhancement that introduced a new field in service called internal traffic policy that is used by Kubla, um proxy to filter the endpoint it routes. So when it's set to cluster, um, all endpoints are considered, which means that it will behave as usual. But when it's set to local, um, only no local endpoints will be considered, which means that only um, it will only send traffic to service on the same node. Next. Um, block service external IPs via admission. Um, this is enhancement is new that gra graduated straight to stable uh, in response to vulnerability that was identified, which allows unprivileged um, user to hijack an IP address via service aspect. Um, and this enhancement blocks the use of external IPs by allowing user to disable the external IPs and block the deployment of any resource that uses external IP fields. Next, um, namespace scope ingress class parameter. This enhancement was created to support many use cases that needed the ability to reference namespace scope parameters. Now you can do that just by specifying parameters for the ingress cl um, class with the namespace scope. Um, topology aware hints is a new enhancement that provides hints to cluster components to um, influence how traffic is routed so that um, components like Coop proxy can be more efficient and keep service traffic within the same zone. Next, um, next one is deprecation top, um, topology aware routing service. Um, specifically topology keys API is now deprecated in favor of top, uh, topology aware hints that was just mentioned before this slide. 
So to summarize, um, SIG Network introduced many new alpha enhancements and focused on stickability um, improvements. So shout outs to them for all their hard work and getting a total of nine enhancements into 1.21. Now let's take a look at SIG Node. So SIG Node is also another big one with nine enhancements. Um, first one is, next slide please. <laughs> first one is <laughs> the TL support. So this one actually has been around since 1.4 um, and it allows, allows interaction with Linux, uh, Linux this CTL service to tune OS parameters. And it's been beta since 1.11 and now with 1.21 stable. Next, um, provide a run as group feature for containers in a pod. So this one graduates to st um, stable. This is another old one um, that's been around since 1.10. Um, it supports the run as group field inside the security context field in a pod. And it's been beta since 1.14 and now stable. Next. Um, we have Memory Manager, uh, which is a new enhancement from SIGNODE. It's a new component in Kubelet ecosystem to guarantee uh, memory allocation for pods um, in a guaranteed quality of service class by using single or multiple NUMA um, allocation strategy. Um, this will be useful for any apps that require memory optimization, like pocket processing or databases. Next, um, Graceful No Shutdown graduates to beta and is now enabled by default. With this enhancement enabled, Kubelet will detect no system shutdown and try to gracefully terminate when um, the pods running on the nodes. Um, add downward API support for huge pages um, graduates to beta. Um, this enhancement allows Pod to fetch information under huge page requests and limits um, using the downward API. Next, um, remove C advisor JSON metrics from Kubelet. So this enhancement um, has been deprecated since 1.18, and now by graduating to stable, it has been removed permanently. Um, so yeah, next. Um, add configurable grace period to probes. Um, this enhancement introduces a um, probe level termination grace period seconds um, in addition to pod level termination grace period second that was um, already available as a solution to um, an edge case when liveness probes are used with a long grace period. Extend pod resource API to report allocable um, resources. Um, this is another new enhancement. Um, this extends the pod resource endpoints to allow third party consumer to um, learn about the compute resource uh, um, allocated to the pods using the get allocatable resource endpoint. Um, this also means that it will be just easier to evaluate the node capacity. Um, CRI container log rotation is another enhancement that's been around for a long time and finally graduates to stable. Um, this ena uh, enhancement enables um, container log rotation for container runtime interface. And um, like I said, it's been around since 1.10 um, and now it's stable. So it's really nice to see a lot of old features finally graduating um, to stable from SIGNode and new enhancements like um, Memory Manager. That was a big at first, so huge shout out to SIGNode. Um, now let's look at SIG scheduling. So um, SIG scheduling had two enhancements. The first one is honor nominated node during new scheduling cycle. Um, this allows user to define a preferred node to speed up scheduling a pod. Um, instead of evaluating all the um, node to find the best candidate, you can now define the preferred node in a new field, nominated node name inside a pod now. Next, um, namespace selector for pod affinity, another new enhancement for six scheduling. 
um, this enhancement introduced a uh, namespace selector to allow setting namespaces for affinity term dynamically to allow namespace specification uh, um, by labels instead of names. Um, in addition, it introduces um, cross namespace affinity that limits which namespaces are allowed to have pods with affinity term that cross namespaces. So um, shout out to Six Scheduling for two awesome new enhancements. Now I'm gonna pass it to Nebarun to go over six storage and testing. Thank you. Thank you for all the updates on instrumentation, network, node, and scheduling. That was really awesome to hear about them. Um, so I'll go over the final bits of this webinar uh, and go over like storage, testing, and a bit about uh, our release stream shadow program. Um, so as I discussed earlier, as I mentioned earlier, uh, immutable secrets and config maps have gone to alpha. So you can specify um, and protect, specify that uh, secrets and config, specify secrets and config maps to be immutable, uh, which will eventually protect against like unnecessary updates or like accidental updates. Um, also, Kubelet does not poll for such secrets and config maps, which results in like much better performance. Um, the other thing that I mentioned as a major theme was uh, PV health monitor. So right now, the user experience uh, with this, and if you enable this uh, feature gate, uh, it will drastically enable uh, the user experience of handling the issues with underlying storage. Um, so you you will know in a better way. And this, this also gives you uh, a really early signal of any storage failures that may happen um, potentially like preventing your workloads uh, going down in future. Um, next up is storage capacity constraints for pod scheduling. So with this feature, when you when you try when uh, the scheduler tries to schedule a pod uh, to a node, it will now keep on checking like whether the requested storage capacity. For example, if you say like, hey, I need ten gigs of uh, um, storage, uh, 10 gigs of uh, 10 gigs of a PV uh, along with this pod, but does that node even have the backing capability to have that storage? So now you can specify those constraints, and it will block pod creation on on those nodes. Um, generic ephemeral inline volumes. Um, so with with this change, you can have like really lightweight local volumes, um, which uh, need to be eventually provided by those CSI drivers. But now what will happen is like the pod will be the owner of the volume claim. And if those kinds of ephemeral volume claims or uh, ephemeral volumes, um, which are created due to this pod being present, if the pod is create, created, the volume claims will also be created. And this is done through the owner ref uh, mechanisms. Um, Next up is prioritizing nodes based on uh, volume capacity. Again, uh, this will this will result in like pods being scheduled on nodes where the available cap capacity is actually close to the requested capacity. For example, let's say you have like 100 gigs on one node and your pod or or a volume or a claim requires like 10 10 GB. So it may it may try to schedule there if you don't have any other, but let's say you have a node where you have like 20 gigs of uh, storage available. It will try to schedule there. So it it does some kind of heuristic based scheduling um, where it will eventually try to optimize your volumes resource usage. Um, again, saying this is alpha, this sounds really cool. So probably you should enable and try it out. Um, one of the things uh, that graduated from uh, Alpha to beta is Azure file CSI drivers migration to out of tree uh, CSI driver. So earlier in one of the previous releases, Azure, Azure disk also moved out uh, to out of tree. Um, and this has been done for Azure file provider as well. Now, one interesting bit to note here is that the feature flag here is uh, by default set to false although this is beta, and this is because of the entry to out of tree uh, driver migration. For more details, uh, do look at the tracking issue and the cap, um, which has like more details and more discussions on uh, how, why this is even necessary. 
service account for CSI driver. So now um, the CSI drivers can essentially request for like audience bounded service account tokens um, of those specific pods from kubelet to not publish volume. Um, so with that, you can uh, or the CSI drivers can essentially like re-execute it, re-execute not publish volumes in a best effort manner. Um, that was all for uh, six storage. And you, you might see like there have been lots of improvements on the CSI driver side of things and how to involve uh, or how to evolve and uh, improve the user experience of uh, cluster admins or end users when they're trying any workload on uh, workload which attaches storage volumes. Um, moving over to testing, uh, SIG testing um, shipped in the basal removal uh, cap, which basically meant that now uh, the basal based build and related and related release tooling are now remote, and CI processes which used to use basal are now using the native tools like make build, which essentially use goes uh, tool chain. Um, this has also resulted in, in like reduced stress on the um, community that they need, they don't need to uh, think and maintain like multiple build systems. They can just use the native go tool chain. Um, that's all um, on the updates from each SIG and you have seen like how 51 um, features have been shipped out by uh, the community as a whole, and uh, we have seen like lots of interesting things that you should try out, and uh, lots of interesting ways that uh, the feature set has evolved over time. Um, having discussed all about the Kubernetes um, release, the exact Kubernetes release, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the release team shadow program. Um, the release team shadow program is basically an apprenticeship or an internship program through which any new contributor or any contributor who is interested in participating in Kubernetes releases can start up with the Kubernetes release um, sustainably. Like uh, they will be mentored by each of these uh, role leads, um, and each of the role leads sign up like three to five shadows depending on the role and uh, what kind of workload uh, is involved in the team. And this program is usually like four months. Four months, why? Because the Kubernetes release cycle is for four months now. And all throughout the release cycle, the shadows are mentored so that they can take on the lead role um, next time. Um, so with that, that is the end of the session. You might have already asked questions. So we will try to see if we can answer a few of them. Otherwise, we'll take it to Slack. Um, one thing that I want to ask, like, uh, and uh, I'm going to sh stop sharing. And one thing I would like to ask, and then Divya to maybe mention a bit, like when they started with the Kubernetes release, um, which cycle so that people can also get motivated uh, hearing your journey. Yeah, so um, I <clears throat> started with 1.17, I believe, right? Um, um, I actually was an enhancement shadow with Navaroon, and then um, I've been part of it since then. So I shadow for multiple roles like enhancements, uh, bug triage, and docs. And then I actually led multiple roles as well. I was a docs lead and enhancement lead. And now I'm um, participating in the 1.22 release as a release lead shadow. So. Yeah, I've been here for a really long time and really enjoy it. Um, Divya, what about you? Well, I think I am uh, a relate to the most, uh, both of you here. So I joined last year as uh, the release shadow on the 1.19 uh, release cycle. And um, uh, it was as a dark shadow and I worked alongside Anna for that. Um, after that, I've been I shadowed the comms role and uh, led the comms role last cycle, as you'll already probably know from the introduction bit. Um, and uh, along with Anna, again, uh, I am one of the release leads for a uh, release lead shadows. Sorry, for uh, this cycle, that's one point two two. 
So it's been an amazing experience and it's it's a highly recommended experience that, um, you know, I advise every student, every um, aspirant to get into open source to uh, join in because it's it's a different thing uh, to contribute to something that's larger than yourself. So, um, yeah, that's about it from me. Awesome. Thank you both for your experiences. And yeah, I also started in like Kubernetes 1.17. Um, I started out as an announcement shadow and then shadowed announcements again, then led announcements in 1.19, then eventually like became the release lead shadow and led the release uh, in 1.21. So it's a fun journey. Um, if you want to learn a lot about how the Kubernetes community works, this is one of the programs that you should look at. Um, the program has been like really competitive in the past few cycles. So don't worry, even if you are not selected, like you can still contribute uh, to the community in a lot of different ways. Um, we do hang out in the Kubernetes Slack. Um, so I'm just leaving the link to the Slack on the chat. So if you want to join, please do so. Um, we are on uh, the channel called SIG Release, uh, where most of the release team hangs out. So. Thank you all uh, for joining today. And thank you, uh, the event, uh, Anna, for um, co-hosting this session with me. Um, this was really great uh, to enumerate through all the uh, features in Kubernetes 1.21. So handing thank over to Libby. All. Thank you all so much. Thank you for joining us at CNCF at our live webinar. Thank you, Divya, Anna, and Nabroon for leading us through this. And check the website later today, and the recording and slides will all be up and ready to go. And thank you guys so much. Keep the conversation moving on the Slack channels, and we'll see y'all next time.